Well, let's get to our first guest of today. It's, I'm really excited to have uh, her with us. She's a co-author of many best-selling books. She's a spiritual leader for the Church of Today. And, of course, you know her. She ran for president in the Democratic primary in 2020. She's a columnist at Newsweek Magazine, too, I just found out today. Please welcome Marianne Williamson. Marianne, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Jimmy, for having me. So can you, it was quite a run for you, huh? That, 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 you know, I'm sure you learned a lot. Tell us, tell us about your journey and the 2020 presidential campaign and what you think you learned. Well, I learned that uh, the American people are very intelligent. I learned talking to audiences, to people at campaign events, particularly in those primary states, the early primary states, how intelligent, how decent, how ready people are to hear depth, to hear some authentic real conversation. So in a way it increased my, um, my trust and my faith in what can happen in a democracy when you really do allow the people to be the governing force. But okay. it also deepened my suspicions about the, uh, what I call the campaign industrial complex, mm -hmm. the campaign uh, political media industrial complex and how much it thwarts uh, the will of the people. And that divergence is, I believe, uh, tragic, given that so much of our politics does not embody and does not display the basic decency and goodness of the American people. I feel that having been in that experience, I understand why. Yeah. So you, I, I, you would probably agree that the core problem is the corporate capture of our government. Of course. OK, so fantastic. So you wrote an article that I, I got today. Uh, is It's in Newsweek, and um, it was great. I read the whole, it was a fantastic article, and talks about how we have to confront ourselves in order to, uh, you know, kind of re be reborn again, right, as a country, which is a great message. Here, let me just, here's one part I just want to read for you, and then you can comment on it. It says, for a transformative transformation to occur as a nation, we're going to have to do the work any individual must do to turn such a crisis into an opportunity. It won't be easy, and there will be truths we'll try our best to avoid. So what are some of those truths that we're going to try our best to avoid, that we shouldn't be avoiding? Well, the one that was formed, uh, well, two of them, which are the two main ones, formed pillars of my campaign. The first has to do with racial injustice in the United States, which is why a pillar of my campaign was reparations for slavery. You know, Jimmy, I was <laughs> I was so blown away when you sent me uh, uh, a piece from your own show about Jungian psychology. I was like, whoa. And of course, you were talking about the Jungian concept of bringing the darkness to the light, that that the spiritual path is not where you bring light to the darkness, but where you bring the darkness to the light in a kind of detox. So an individual cannot heal, an individual cannot regenerate, an individual cannot move on without facing the, the darker shadows in our, in our past. It's stuff has to be cleaned up, whether it's 200 years old or two weeks old. And so that is why, starting with slavery, of course, not only 250 years of slavery, but then that, of course, was followed by another 100 years, except for those 12 years of reconstruction, of institutionalized violence against Black people. And then, of course, as we know, even since the Civil Rights Legislation and Voting Rights Act in 64 and 65, in many ways, we've slid backwards rather than going forward with mass incarceration, racial injustice and criminal sentencing, et cetera. That is our primary. It's the primary, uh, I feel, issue that we have to bring forward, expunge, atone for and make amends for. The second, of course, has to do with the uh, imperialistic militarism that has become so much a part of our foreign policy establishment, particularly in the last 40 to 50 years. And that's why I stood for a Department of Peace and a real uh, recognition when you talk about corporate capture, of course, the corporate capture uh, is personified uh, and fully embodied by the military industrial complex, where our foreign policy is, is dominated more by the profit-making capacity of Raytheon and Northrop Grumman, Grumman and Boeing than by any real effort to, uh, for the United States to be peacemakers on the earth. So those are the main two, but we're people and uh, we have plenty as we move along, but those are, I believe, the, the two major issues that we as a country must confront if we want to have a sustainable and survivable future. Yes, and not uh, just to add to your point, the, um, the military-industrial complex, the budget 
under Donald Trump, who the Democrats and the media tell us is a traitor to our country, working in tandem with a foreign leader who has nefarious intentions for the United States. They gave him an extra hundred and thirty two billion dollars every year, not just once, but every year into perpetuity for more war and killing. One hundred and thirty two billion every year. The Democrats and Republicans agreed to give to they who they say is a madman and an existential threat to our planet. That's how much. How corruption is happening in our in our complete oligarchy, and it's a rapacious oligarchy. And so, anyway, so that's so. I'm, that's well, just I to put. Go ahead. Uh, well, I agree with you. The Democrats don't have a lot to be proud of in that um, in in that regard. And uh, the Democrats also, the House Democrats in the House passed that le- that latest authorization bill. Yes. So you're right, and um, I thought it was particularly interesting. Other than uh, Tulsi Gabbard and myself. I couldn't believe during the campaign, why aren't we talking about the military industrial complex? Of course, Bernie would talk about about Yemen specifically, the $360 billion arms sale to Saudi Arabia, which we uh, got in exchange for giving aerial support to their genocidal war in Yemen. Right. And there was a bipartisan effort to stop that, led in part by Bernie, who of course Trump vetoed. But uh, even there, in the last uh, defense authorization bill that was, once again, okay by Democrats, th- th- there was blocked any effort. Uh, to uh, to stop that, as well as any effort to take power away from him regarding military action against Iran. Yes. Um, so I, 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 I found this, um, you know, so would you consider yourself, uh, I consider myself a new age spiritualist, I think. Do you, would do you, does that matter? Do you consider yourself that? Well, it matters. Well, it, 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 you're, you're seen very differently. Uh, if they say those words about you, then if they say those words about me, if they say, if somebody says those words about you, they go, oh, that's interesting. They say those words about me, they're more likely to say, oh my God, that's a the woman is a nutcase. You've got to keep her away from any, any uh, serious political role. So, so, well, the reason I bring it up is because some people say this, some people say this about new age thought that, uh, that politics is a distraction from what really matters and what really matters is self-transformation and spiritual enlightenment. What do you say to that? I grew up at a time, for instance, when I was in college, we read Ram Dass and Alan Watts in the morning. Wow. Me too. Yeah. And then in the afternoon, we went to Vietnam anti-war protests. It was both and. I grew up at a time, like in the 70s, also in the 60s, the cultural revolution at that time included all of the above. It was musical, it was sexual, it was philosophical, it was political, and it, it was spiritual. This idea of categorizing these things into separate lanes, Pre- uh, prevents us from having a deeper holistic understanding of what's happening. It's all systems breakdown. And the only way that we're going to be able to heal this country is with an all systems approach to problem solving. And an all systems approach to problem solving realizes that civilization is an ecosystem. You can't leave out any one part of it or separate one part of it and say, ah, the answer lies there. When in fact, the answer lies in the interplay and interrelationship between all the parts of who we are and all the parts of what a society is. So I agree uh, with that, by the way. I think that's part, you know, Ram Dass used to talk about having one foot in the spiritual world and one foot in the uh, material world, right? And and he talked about the balance, and you can't be in one or the other, or you'll be out of balance, and you have to be— You know, I'll tell you a Ram Dass anecdote that I've never told before. When I was invited to the White House in 1990, uh, four at the end of 1994, I felt that I had to go to the big man to ask his permission, you know. So I called Ram Das and uh, asked him what he thought about that. And boy, he yelled at me. Uh, he yelled at me for uh, taking part in uh, uh, something so um, he wasn't for it. But when I saw him many years ago later in Hawaii, he had really transformed after his stroke. He was really a different person, and he was very, very sweet. He remembered that, and he told me, "I think it's good that you went." Was but he boy, he, he shouted at me at the time. He didn't really, like he shouted at yeah. you. That's because that you know. Oh, that- he, well, he was a very different. I don't know if you knew. You know, the young Ram Dass versus the older Ram Dass, real different kind of personalities. Yeah, he, he was he well, was tough, and then at the end, he was just so sweet. Well, I know he would tell stories about this guy. Uh, Neem Karoli Baba, and he would talk about how he would throw apples at people. 
and tell him to get out and kick him in the head. And well, stuff. Ram Dass had that. He had that more Eastern guru toughness in his earlier years. Mm, yeah, but he was, he was also a hilarious storyteller. He could have been a stand-up comedian, no trouble. I love listening to him. He's such a great speaker. But what? So let me ask you: What do you? How would to you? What is enlightenment? Light. The Course in Miracles uh, defines light as understanding. I think so much of our human experience is a big misunderstanding. And when you look at a little baby, they understand still. They just look at everybody with love. They reach out to everybody with love. There's no greater demonstration of enlightenment on the planet than the state of, of infancy. And that's why we all melt in the presence of, of an infant. Enlightenment is not a learning, it's an unlearning. It's an unlearning of the falseness of the world, the illusions of the world, the illusion that we are separate from one another, and the illusion that we're here for any other purpose than to love one another. And we're all so misinformed. And from the earliest uh, time in our lives, we are taught such a uh, false interpretation of, of living that we instinctively become more um, prone to fear, more prone to anger, more prone to defensiveness, to the point where natural loving thinking feels unnatural to us and unnatural fear-based thinking feels natural. I mean, if you look at how the world behaves today, politics is a perfect example. Fear-based responses are considered more often than not reasonable and legitimate, even when they have to do with the rape and the, and the destruction of our planet, even when they have to do with, with criminal injustices towards other human beings and other countries. That's considered adult, sophisticated conversation. And yet when somebody talks about what it would mean to align political policies with our capacity and propensity to love one another, that's, that's considered dangerous. And of course, it's marginalized by making it appear uh, silly, ridiculous, less sophisticated, and obviously the purview of someone who just doesn't understand reality. So why is, it seems like some people, I'm so, I hope this isn't a dumb question because I wanted to ask this of someone smart for a long time. But why is it that some people seem to have be blessed with enlightenment and then other people like me have to twist themselves in pretzels and knots to try to get at it? You know, like uh, Eckhart Tolle just had an, a spontaneous uh, enlightenment and awakening, and so did the, uh, you know, Ram Dass's guru. That's not, it doesn't seem fair. Like, why? <laughs> like, is the that. Vast a of us, the vast majority of us do not have the spontaneous Eureka enlightenment experience. Uh, and that doesn't make our path less important. I'm like you. And you and I are like the vast majority of people on the planet. We're, we're crawling, our, our knees are sore, our elbows are sore. But that doesn't mean our path is any less rich. Uh, the fact that we, that we get there kicking and screaming doesn't make it any less rich. I think that we want to forego these sort of grandiose images of enlightenment. All of a sudden, someone went, Eureka! I think that the, the more typical uh, spiritual experience is just the experience of maturity, the experience of growing up, the experience of having done irresponsible things, and then having to face the shame of knowing, who was I that I would have treated someone like that? Who was I that I would have bought into that? To me, that's almost a bigger drama. You know, the fact that it involved a lot of tears on the way, a lot of humiliation on the way, a lot of embarrassment and failure on the way, that to me is not less traumatic and, and it's not less important. And um, I, uh, I don't think any of us should apologize for the fact that we get triggered and we have a hard time, but we're trying and we're, we're staying in there. And um, there's drama and I believe beauty and grandeur to that as well. So that whole thing about... Oh, there's so many things I want to ask. Like, so about being triggered, right? So from what little I've been able to ascertain is the thing that triggers you the most in other people is the thing that you're denying about yourself the most. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I want to vibrate at a, at a, at a higher frequency, right? So I can attract better energy and things into my life and serendipity and synchronicity. But at the same time, if I, how do I do that and still go into my darkness uh, at the same time? Do you have any tips on that for that? Well, The Course in Miracles says it's not up to you what you learn. It's merely up to you whether you learn through joy or through pain. Uh, 
So at a certain point, once you know how consciousness operates, you want to avoid the pain. And you know that there is another way. You don't have, you know, we all are wounded, Jimmy. We're all wounded. And, you know, enlightened masters, you mentioned Eckhart. I think he's there. I get that. I've been around him enough to believe he's there. But the vast the majority of us, we're still wounded in places. But you can make a choice in life. I know that I'm wounded, but I don't have to act from my wound. Hmm. I can choose not to act from it. For me, Donald Trump is a perfect example. Um, Martin Luther King said, thank God God didn't say I have to like my enemies. Oh, excuse me. He said I didn't have to love them. He didn't say I didn't have to like them. Or, yeah, right. <laughs> so if I demonize him personally, it doesn't help. It, it, do, it doesn't help. It doesn't, it, it doesn't increase my political perspicacity to demonize him personally. And I think that we can make a choice about that. So I know that if I just get into personal demonization of those with whom I disagree, it will hold me back. That's my darkness. I'm not saying I don't feel it. I'm not saying I don't yell at the television. But you make a choice in life. And I think that sometimes we put too much stock on where we have actually gotten to and not enough stock on how we choose to behave, whether we've gotten there or not. I can have an angry response to something, but I can still, as an adult woman, say, I'm a choice whether or not I'm going to respond in an immature, unconscious way. See, that's the that's the goal. Like, so I, I remember I told the story on the show. I, I had an, in, an encounter with my mother where she had via. She crossed a boundary of my privacy and she now wanted to have a conversation about my comedy acts. And I knew instinctively at 24 years old, I had read enough self-help books that I knew that she had crossed a boundary and that now she was in toxic behavior and this was her problem and not mine. And that if I did engage in it with her, that that was going to bring me down and I didn't need to, this wasn't a problem. As Carl Jung says, this wasn't a problem I could fix. I'm never going to ex explain to my mom what it's like to be an artist and that she can't control it, that I had to outgrow it. And I outgrew it, meaning I saw it as her problem and not my own problem. And so that's what I want to get to, like, with politics. So I do get, like you said, I do demonize the person often. That's definitely a flaw, flaw, flaw of mine. And I, I get a little too black and white. And so that's what my goal now is to not be triggered so where I could see someone doing something horrible in a sense and not have it control my emotions. Isn't that kind of the goal? Absolutely. It's about where, whether we're triggered uh, with an emotionality. And also, I believe on a political level, it almost distracts us from the larger point. It's the systems that are evil. It doesn't serve for any, because if anybody thinks it's just that one person or just those two people, then somebody might be led to believe if we just got rid of that one person. Donald Trump is a perfect example. There's so many lined up behind him. So huh. it doesn't even serve. And, and secondly, I, I want to point out the quote from Martin Luther King Jr. That is, you have very little morally persuasive power with people who can feel your underlying contempt. If you're just angry at individuals, you're definitely going to get an applause from people who already agree with you. But isn't the point to broaden the audience of more enlightened political thinking? And that means to be able to, as Martin Luther King would say, morally persuade others. You know, I have a, I'd like to go back a little bit to what you said about your mother. Because I, and at about the same age you're talking about, at 34, I think you said, was going through the same stuff with my mother that everybody does. And at 37, I got pregnant and I uh, decided I was going to have the baby. Now, I had all the same stuff going on with my mother that everyone did, does at that age or many people do. But my mother went into complete apoplectic upset. You're not going to marry him. You're not going to marry him. Oh, my God. You're not going to marry him. You're going to have this child by yourself. You're not going to marry him. And <laughs> I remember... I prayed about it, and I remember a conversation I had with my mother. And the trigger was gone, the emotionality was gone, and I remember saying to my mother, I would like nothing more than for you to be with me on this journey. Mm. I can't think of anything I would like more than to think that you and I were talking every day and that I was learning from you and being helped by you and advised by you and loved by you. 
but I am having this baby and I can't take the negativity of the upset. There was something about the way I said it to her, Jimmy, she got it. She got it. And from that day forward, she never again uttered a word that was anything but supportive. Oh, wow. It completely transformed my relationship with her. It was a major piece of my pregnancy and my motherhood in those days. But it was when I was able, I wasn't stomping my feet. Mommy, you can't talk to me like this. I'm a grown woman or any crap like that. I just had gotten to that point where I was very calm. And I just let her know. And she changed like that. And I never heard her say a negative word about that again. And I, I never forgot that situation. Um, my having a tantrum would not have helped. Wow. that's. Uh, I'm sure that's a very useful story to a lot of people who are watching. So I really appreciate you. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I just have two questions left. I really appreciate your time. So I appreciate being you know, our, so our, you've heard that our deepest fear is not what we are, that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Okay, but uh, when does confidence become megalomania, and is there a way to prevent it? I'm a woman who believes in a higher power. I'm a woman who believes in God. I'm a woman who uh, is grounded in faith that there is a higher power inside us. So my confidence does not come from any idea that Marianne can do anything. My confidence comes from the fact that there is a power in me, but not of me, that makes me no better than you or anyone else, but no less than you or anyone else. And that that higher power is the source of unlimited uh, wisdom, unlimited intelligence, unlimited guidance uh, to the extent to which we seek it. I think we even know what that the brain, we normally use about 10% of our brain cells. Uh, in The Course in Miracles, there's a line that really inspires me. It says, those who have achieved the most in life have achieved a fraction of what all of us are capable of. So I believe that all of us have only, we've only begun to tap into the amazing uh, potential for self-actualization. And that amazing potential for self-actualization isn't generated by you. It's not generated by me. It's the same force that turns an, an acorn into an oak tree. It's the same force uh, that turns a bud into a blossom. I just believe that just like the acorn is already programmed to become the oak tree, you and I are already programmed to become the highest manifestation of which we're capable. I've lived enough to know that if I leave all that to Marianne, <laughs> oh God, the, sab the self-sabotage, the self-destruction, the self-undermining, the, the neurotic behavior. I'm not leaving this to Marianne. I, I know what happens, but I know that when through my practice, and of course the course says your good intentions are not enough, your willingness is everything. To the extent, and I'm not a perfect enlightened master by any means, but to the extent to which I do practice that, when I do practice what I preach, um, pretty wonderful things happen in my life. When I don't, I fall down and crash and burn like anybody else does. I think I heard Ram Das once say that, uh, you know, now that I'm on the spiritual path, I haven't gotten rid of my neuroses. They just don't bother me as much. So. Well, I think they don't bother you as much when you know you have a choice whether or not to act from them. You know, you were talking earlier about triggers, right? Yes. The reason the path is difficult, let's say I have a bitchy thought, I'm about to say something mean or be defensive or angry. Sometimes it's as simple as somebody saying to me, oh, Marianne, lighten up. Marianne, get over yourself. Marianne, stop it. You know better. And sometimes that's really all you need is somebody to say, oh, get over yourself. And you go, you're right, you're right, you're right. Cancel, cancel. But sometimes these reactions are triggers that come from childhood or that come from cellular memory of how your ancestors were treated or whatever. And it's harder. And that's where the spiritual path comes in, because that's where you ask a power greater than you to do for you what you cannot do for yourself, where you say, dear God, I'm really pissed. I'm really angry, but I'm willing to see this differently. I'm willing to act uh, in a different way. And uh, really, that's what the miracle is when changes happen inside you that by yourself, you don't think you could have made happen. So do you, I saw, I don't know how much you're into this, but I, I've noticed the convergence of quantum physics and mysticism and spirituality. There's a, a quantum physicist wrote a book recently 
not recently, about eight years ago. Anyway, he talks about how uh, there's an ocean of energy, and then there is a wave, and then the, there's the crest of the wave. And we are the crest of a wave of energy. Uh, if, uh, although we can't see the wave, uh, we only see the crest. Just like if you're in an airplane and, you, and you're going over the ocean, you see the white lines, the crest. You can't see the wave, but you know it's there. And that's the same thing. Like there, the energy wave is there. We're just the crest of it. The, the, and that's from a physicist. So do you find that remarkable that science and mysticism are actually coming together? On such a level, you know, the 21st century mindset is different than the 20th century, just like the 20th was different than the 19th. The 20th century mindset is dominated by an old Newtonian physics. It's actually an increasingly obsolete notion of science, where it, the world is seen as a big machine. And if you want to change the machine, you just tweak the pieces of it. That's why during the campaign, I thought it was so funny when people told me I was unscientific. No, they were unscientific. They're grounded in a 20th century science. 21st century science, phys quantum physics recognizes the primacy of consciousness. Yes. Uh, a British physicist said, uh, it turns out the world is not one big machine. It's one big thought. Yes. Ex yes. That's how it reacts. And, and that is, that is science. That is more scientific. Yes. Yes. But, okay. but like every other aspect of the political and uh, media uh, industrial complex, they're so stuck in in the 20th century. They. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, that's, in fact, the ex almost the exact language. The fact you know, I'm blanking on the physicist's name and, of course, the name of the book. I'm bad at that stuff. But I remember the concepts. And he talked about the energy ocean, not the way, but the energy ocean is best akin to a thought. It's consciousness. It so, is. from a spiritual perspective, it literally is. Yes. Yes. Oh, wow. So, my final question first of all, thanks again. This is great. I hope we can do it again. Thank and you. both you and Sting are very spiritual, and both of you stay suspiciously slender. Is it safe I'm to sorry, say? I couldn't hear you, Jimmy, both myself and who? Sting. The musician, See, oh, yeah, the, the musician? Okay. yeah, you're both you both <laughs> consider yourself very spiritual and you both stay suspiciously slender. Is it safe to say your shadow self consumes a lot of cookies and potato chips? Uh, not cookies and potato chips. Um, my shadow self uh, becomes self-involved, self-pitying, self-reference too much. Not potato chips and cookies. OK, it's worse it's stuff in my head that I go into. OK. Well, Mary, I try to take it for my better self. All right. Well, I hope you had fun today. It was really a pleasure to have you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be with you, Jimmy. Thank you so much for everything you do. Okay. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Hey, everybody. This is the part where I tell you where all our live shows are, but there aren't any. And then this is why I tell you we join our premium program, get extra content, but nobody's got a fucking job. So just enjoy the video.